okay today? Well, we're going to jump into a, a four-part series on the Holy Spirit uh, in just a moment. We're calling it Unseen. Uh, we're going to jump into that in just a moment. Uh, four weeks full of Scripture and principles about the, the person of the Holy Spirit. Get there in just a moment. If you call Action Church home, you may have noticed that we did not worship God with our giving in the middle of service like we, we have been recently. Kind of going back to what we used to do the first several years of church, we're going to worship God with our giving uh, at the end of the service. It's going to help us in multiple different ways really focus on worshiping God with our giving and just keep some of you from leaving here at Winter Park. And so, gotcha. And so uh, don't leave the buckets are passed. You don't leave a restaurant without paying. Don't come here. I'm just kidding. That's totally a joke. <laughs> you don't have to pay me, but you probably should give back to God all that he's given to you. And that's really up to you and God. And so, totally kidding, but seriously, don't leave. Uh, we're gonna worship God with our giving uh, at the end of service. Speaking of, of your generosity, we really we are a generous church. And we talked about last week, Vision Sunday. We gather so that we can grow, so we can go into the community. And, and I was talking to Pastor Eddie, our location pastor here at Winter Park, and, and Pastor Eddie and, and Dr. Hunter and some of our team went and, and started a new partnership this week with Experience Christian Center in Pine Hills. And we're really partnering with them for education, for feeding, uh, mentoring, uh, sports programs uh, and for families in the inner city of, of Pine Hills and really making a, a, a mental impact, an emotional impact, a social impact, and most importantly, a, a spiritual impact in that community. Really excited about that new partnership. And I just, I couldn't spend enough time telling you all that we're able to do together, both because of God's calling uh, and your generosity. And so thank you so much for believing and the vision of Action Church, a church that doesn't just exist to just come and gather, but we really are making a difference in our communities, meeting needs, but most importantly, arranging a meeting with Jesus. Our prayer is that all of our partnerships, all of our outreaches is not just meeting a physical need. That is great, and we are called to help those that are, are hurting or that may need help in different seasons, but the most important thing is that we solve eternity. So thank you so much for going into the community, whether you go with us or you give generously to help fund us going, we are making a, a huge difference together. And so really honored to be a part of that with you and, and help uh, make a difference in this community together. Unseen week one, talking about the often forgotten part of the Godhead, the often forgotten part of the Trinity. Come on, we love talking about God the Father because we get it. We got fathers, we have mothers, we have parental figures in our life. God the Father makes a little bit of sense to us, even if we don't know a lot about doctrine or theology. God the Father, Jesus the Son, it, it makes sense. Maybe not the Son and part of the Trinity, but Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, he lived 33 years, he experienced everything we experienced. We both, we can correlate kind of to both of those. When we get to the, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, oftentimes we kind of leave that part out. A lot of denominations, a lot of doctrines, a, a lot of Christians do life without the Holy Spirit because we don't understand who he is. I grew up in a church, New King James Version, Holy Ghost. And we think the Holy Spirit is weird. I want to submit to you today across all of our locations, the Holy Spirit isn't weird, you are. <laughs> he hasn't made himself weird, you made him weird. People are weird. I want to start all, all, all four weeks talking about some weird things that we all do. Weird things we all do. I read this week that 67% of people Google themselves on a consistent basis. That's weird because you're not that important. <laughs> if you ever Google yourself, you'll find there's a lot of people named with your exact name. You could really get a case of misidentity. Like, I didn't do that. Maybe good or bad. Some of, sometimes you'll find things that people did way better than you or way worse than you. So you got to be careful. You Google yourself. Uh, people are weird. You ever been in a place, Publix, Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Target, and, and you see somebody that you know and you pretend that you don't see them? And you think that they don't know that you're pretending. You're like in an aisle. You're like, oh, I'm just looking around. I'm just, oh, hey, I didn't see you. I know you saw me. I saw you. You're eye, we made eye contact. And you're like, you're busy. Come on, you got to get back to the kids. You got to get back to work. Or you, you know them, but you don't like them. <laughs> I know that's none of you, none of you. I've never done that personally, never in my life. I love everybody, just like the Bible says. And so people are weird. Come on, you ever tried to, to, to sneak a sniff? They didn't get that first service easier. Come on, you, you smell some body odor. You're like, who is that? Is that me? And you're like, you do a little. It's weird. You're, 
Or you're like, oh, oh just, just. We know what you're doing. Come on, this happened to me this week. People are weird. I'm weird. I was walking by a car, and oftentimes car windows double great as mirrors, right? You're walking in, maybe, you know, you're always checking for your wallet, making sure your, your zipper's up, and you do I have anything in my teeth, in my face. I kind of felt something in my face, so I'm looking, and I'm kind of fixing my face, checking my teeth. And there's a family of four in that car. <laughs> you get it. You know what I was doing. We've all been there before. People are weird. Holy Spirit is not weird. Let's take the weird label off the Holy Spirit and let's just place the weird label on some of us. And oftentimes weird is just things that we don't understand. Holy Spirit is not weird. And I wanna take four weeks and talk about this third part of the Trinity, the person of the Holy Spirit. Today is merely an introduction. I'm gonna spend 30 minutes and I'm gonna introduce you to what could be your best friend. I'm gonna introduce you to the person of the Holy Spirit. Then we're gonna talk about what he can do for you, what's available. We're gonna talk about the gifts that he allows us to operate in. And then week four, we're gonna talk about the primary role of the Holy Spirit that most churches and most Christians miss. Most of the time we focus, we make major things out of some of the more minor things that we have access to. And there's a major thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us. Acts chapter 19, let's start there, verse one and two. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And that may be you today. Maybe you today at one of our locations where you came to Palm Sunday or Easter, or lights, camera, action, you're new to this Christian faith thing, and you say, Pastor, I don't even know what, it, I know we've sang about it, and we've read about it, we've talked about the Spirit of God, but if you're honest, you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, and that's okay. But I think for maybe all of us, maybe there are certain parts based off of what we've heard, what we've believed, what we've experienced, that we don't, we've never really fully opened ourselves up to who the Holy Spirit is and what he can do for us. I need you to know that the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. Every time we sang Holy Ghost in my Baptist church growing up, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, it's Casper? Like, that was a popular movie back in the day? Like, is, he, is it like a horror movie? Like, he's not a ghost. He's not really even a spirit. In fact, he's a person. He's the part of the Trinity. He's a gift for all of us. Jesus said as he was leaving, it's better that I go away, talking to his disciples, it's better that I go away so that the gift can come, so that the Holy Spirit can come. If Jesus says it's better for you and I to have access to the Holy Spirit in this life, don't you think we'd want to know who he is and what's available to us? He's a person. It's a relationship that you and I both have access to not a ghost, not a spirit, not something to be scared of. So I wanna ask us to start over, to take off the filters really over four weeks based off of scripture, lots of scripture, lots of teaching over the next four weeks. Not what man has said, not what a pastor has said, not what you have heard, but I really wanna dive into what the Bible says about the person of the Holy Spirit that you and I have access to have a relationship with. The Holy Spirit is a breath of fresh air. It brings new life, breathes new life into you. In fact, a lot of words in our English language are, are not, not the best way to describe things because the Bible, if you're new to church, was written in two different languages, the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. And oftentimes our English language is a poor substitute for these two languages. That's why I would always recommend if you're studying the Bible and really studying doctrine or theology or really trying to figure out what was God actually saying in context and how do I study it, you need to take in the original language into account. And you don't have to know those or memorize those. There are so many great resources online in which you can look up original language. But our, our English word of Holy Spirit is not a very good interpretation of this person the third part of the Trinity. In fact, in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, it was ruach. Ruach, which means a wind, a breath, 
a violent exultation, a blast of breath. Genesis 1, verses 2, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit, the, the Ruach of God, was hovering over the waters. New Testament, pneuma, a current of air, a blast of breath, a, a strong breeze. John chapter six, the words I have spoken to you are pneuma. They are spirit and they are life. I wanna correlate just for a few moments together this introduction, week one of unseen of the Holy Spirit. I, I wanna correlate the difference of the breath of God, the wind of God, and the Holy Spirit. The definition, ruach, pneuma, is the breath of God, the wind of God. I wanna correlate spiritually wind to the Holy Spirit. Write this down if you're taking notes. Wind and the Holy Spirit, wind is unseen. Wind is unseen. John chapter 14 says this, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. It's the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him Check this out, because neither sees him or knows him. The world can't see him or know him. Remember that, but you, you and I, those of us who have started a relationship with Jesus, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So we know him, but we've never seen him. The world hasn't seen him or experienced him, but we know as believers, we know that just because we've never seen him doesn't mean that we don't know him. And when is the perfect correlation? Come on, we, today is a perfect day. It's a perfect example. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing the wind to blow today. Come on, we had a storm this morning and nobody walked outside and thought, wind's not real. <laughs> I can't see it. What's happening out there, that's not real. No, the trees are moving, branches are flying, your hair's all over the place. We couldn't even put our new hair tents up because they would have turned into kites. You know what I mean? Like, gone. Because just because you can't see wind doesn't mean that it's not real. And wind in the Holy Spirit is unseen, but he is real. You can feel wind. You can see the effects of wind. You can see the trees move and you can see the grass and the, the dust fly up. You can see the clouds passing by. Why? Because wind is real and the Holy Spirit is the breath of God, the wind of God. And just because you cannot see it doesn't mean he's not real. I'm here to tell you today, I've never seen it, but I've experienced it. And God, check this. Make sure you get this. Story. God, first of all, is meant to be worshiped. He is God and we are not. He is worthy of our praise. We were created to know God and to make him known, to worship him and fill the earth. He is meant to be worshiped. Then he is meant to be obeyed. But third thing, he's meant to be experienced. It's not just a knowledge thing. It's not just a head thing. It's gotta go from here to here. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. We have an experience with the living God. There's a gift coming. It's not just God the Father on his throne. It's not just Jesus seated at the right hand. You and I can experience the living God through the Holy Spirit. And what does it feel like? Well, it may be so many different things for so many different people. But if you're new to church, I remember walking into a church like ours, a spirit-filled church. I grew up Southern Baptist. I went to a PCA, Reformed Presbyterian High School, and then I gave my life back to Jesus at a spirit-filled church, Church of the Highlands. So, so I got a lot of jacked-up theology in my brain. You know what I mean? I got Armenian, I got Calvin, I got spirit-filled, I got Baptist, I got a little Reformed. I got all of it. I, I understand where you're coming from today. But I remember walking into a, a prayer meeting or a worship service, and, and, I, and I've heard this so many times in our lobbies across our locations or at action steps, and I've heard people say, you know, Pastor, that energy today was fire. That, there was a vibe in there. I got goosebumps. There's just something happened, and that's not energy. That's not vibe. That's called the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not like, oh, my gosh, there was a vibe. There's no vibe in here. You're anti-vibe. It's a spirit of living God. Like, gosh, the preaching was amazing. It wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. You spoke, you spoke right to me. I don't even know you. <laughs> Hear that all the time. You just, you just prepare that just for me. Hi, my name's Justin. What's your name? Obviously, if I don't know your name, I don't know what you're going through. How in the world could thousands have gathered and you feel like I was speaking to you? Holy Spirit. 
can't see him, but I, but I know him. I'm here to tell you today, once you've experienced something and you know something, nobody can convince you any different. And God is meant to be worshiped. He's meant to be obeyed, but he's meant to be experienced as well. Wind is, is unseen. Pastor, you telling me, you telling me that, I, that, I, that I, I need to base my faith on my feelings? No, you cannot run on feelings, but you should be able to feel what you're running on. That's why it's worship and obedience first, but the Holy Spirit is here to give us an experience, to give us passion, to give us encounters that allow us to feel some things and experience things that keeps us motivated to move forward. Wind and the Holy Spirit is unseen. Write this down, number two. Wind and the Holy Spirit, it's, under, it's unpredictable. It's unpredictable. It's not a formula that we can figure out. Jesus answered, the wind, the pneuma, blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. It comes and it goes. It's kind of a guessing game. I play a lot of golf and love golf. And one of the craziest things about playing golf in Florida is you always have to deal with wind. But if you got a tough shot, maybe over a, a water hazard, a penalty area, that you have wind, it makes it so much tougher because there's there's structures, there's trees, there's lakes, there's the prevailing wind, but then there's, there's different swirls of wind and you're always kind of guessing, that, is it gonna blow it or is it not gonna blow it? And even in between shots, one person can hit first and the wind's blowing one way at one strength and then the next person hits and it's blowing a different way at a different strength. Wind and the Holy Spirit is unpredictable. It comes and it goes, it, 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 it gusts up and then it, it lays down. God moves in certain seasons one way, in different seasons a different way. He moves in some people's lives one way, and then he moves in your lives a different way. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is unpredictable. Why do you think that is, Pastor? First off, I'm not, not God, I don't know, but I would like to submit to you, it's because he's unpredictable so that we don't begin to worship a system, routine, or a formula. We have a life of faith. If he's, we're, we're always guessing, we're always searching, God, what are you doing? We have to seek him to find him, if he was predictable, he knows that we would be like A plus B plus C equals this. He's always changing. That's why we're not worshiping a religion, we're worshiping a relationship. Relationships always move and change. The Holy Spirit is a relationship, but it's unpredictable. God doesn't move the same way all the time. Like, come on, let's go Old Testament for a second. He spoke through a burning bush. But he didn't do it again. Come on, you're not asking God, what do I do in this next season? Am I supposed to marry this person? Am I supposed to go after this career? Uh, what are my kids gonna do? Like if you go out and stare at your bushes in the backyard, you're gonna be staring for a long time. But God spoke to Moses in a bush. God, I will do it when you light that bush on fire. You're gonna be there for a minute. Come on, if you think somebody's gonna be healed physically, we're gonna talk about the gift of healing, what the Holy Spirit does. We believe in miracles here at Action Church. We've seen them happen. I'm gonna talk about that week three. Jesus in the Old Testament spits on some dirt, makes mud, and rubs it on some guy's eyes. If you do that, you're gonna get arrested. That's gross. Jesus spit stunk too. He was proving to religious leaders, hey, you think that I have to do this, this, and this, but if God's moving, it doesn't matter the method. Wind and the Holy Spirit are unpredictable. The third one is this. Wind and the Holy Spirit is powerful. How? Come on, you ever been tired? You ever been weary? You ever feel like you're just working so hard? The Holy Spirit can give you power. I want you to hear today the most important decision you'll ever make is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And once you do that, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You accept his life, his death, and his resurrection. Your eternal destination, if that is something that you receive and you are following Jesus, your destination is heaven. And your path there is full of, of purpose. And I believe if you fully commit and follow Jesus the rest of your life, your destination will be secure. However, how you walk that journey is kind of up to you. And I want to ask you, how's the journey going? How's it feeling? 
How's your endurance? How's your peace? How's your joy? If you're missing all of those, I want to submit to you this morning, you may be doing it wrong. Let's say we've got a destination here. We're going, we're going to go to the, the Bahamas. So we're going to go to the Bahamas and on a little trip together. Well, that sounds nice. Go on a little island drink, maybe a little golf, a little, little suntan, a little sea breeze. Sounds great. Everybody else is here is like, no, that's fine. No, I thought that'd be fun. And we get to do it together. It'd be great. It'd be a big, big trip, big boat, cruise, big cruise. Let's just say a few of us are going. There's two different ways. We've got a two-hour trip on the water. We have to go down to maybe Palm Beach or somewhere on the East Coast because you can't, you can't go on a boat from Orlando. I talk to so many people. I'm like, I live in Orlando, and they're like, how's the, how's the ocean? Uh, it's Central Florida. Have you ever seen a map? <laughs> but we'll say we go to the, the East Coast, and we're down there, Palm Beach, and we're going to go to the Bahamas. There, and there's two different modes of transportation. There's a rowboat, and there's a sailboat. How many of you, by a show of hands, here at Winter Park, San Fernando, from West Palm Beach to the Bahamas would choose a rowboat? We are 0 for 2 services. <laughs> then why, spiritually speaking, do most Christians settle for rowing to their destination? You're going to get there? Maybe. But you could be tired. You picked the wrong mode of transportation. And I'm here to tell you today, if you've picked, I can tough it out. I can get through it. I can learn it. I can indoctrinate it. I can discipline it. I'm telling you, you may get there, but you're not going to get there full of peace, purpose, joy, hope. And now there's a second option. And a sailboat still requires work. It doesn't sail itself. It's got to be steered. It's got to be set up. Everything's got to be appropriately worked. You got to shift with the wind. You got to shift the direction. You got to shift the sails. But the thing that powers a sailboat is not our work, not our effort, not our mind. It's the wind. I'm here to tell you there's work involved, but the power in which moves you through your life moves you from where you are to your destination is the wind of God, the breath of God, the power of God. And too many Christians are living powerless because you're rowing when you should be saved. You're rowing in your marriage. You're rowing with your kids and you're rowing with your career and you're rowing with your struggle. And you may get there and you may survive, but you're doing it without the wind. You're doing it without the power of God. Jesus, better that I go away because I have a gift for you. You are taking that gift and you're leaving it on the dock and you're saying, I'll do it on my own. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power. 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 When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? You know your life, I don't know. But I know mine. Why in the world? Would I row when I could be sailing? Would I do it alone when I have access to a person, a relationship, the spirit of the living God to give me power, peace, joy, and hope on my journey to a destination? You'll receive power. Wind is powerful. Last one, write this down. Wind is refreshing. Did that deep breath for two reasons. I've just been preaching without a breath for a long time. <laughs> it's a true statement. And secondly, because I think spiritually speaking, that's what some of you need. You need a <sighs> some of you are out of breath because life has kind of kicked you in the gut. I don't know what it is, but I just, I feel it so heavy in this service more than the first. You just can't quite, and you just need a, whew. mental health 101, a couple of deep breaths just make you feel better regardless of what you're going through. What if you had a spiritual deep breath that you've never experienced before where you just know, I'm gonna get through this. The wind of God, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit is refreshing. Ephesians 4 says, don't grieve God, don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you. Breathing in you. 
giving you breath when you're out of breath, giving you hope when you're hopeless, just breathing new life into you. the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. I have three challenges for us as we close this introduction, part one of, of Unseen. Three challenges I want you to write down and really pray through this week as we go through this week with morning prayer and encounter and hopefully spending time with God, really unpacking and diving into these scriptures as well as what's coming next over the next three weeks. First thing, first challenge to you, write this down, get it in your heart, let go of tradition. Let go of tradition. Proverbs says this, Proverbs 3, verse five, trust God from the bottom of your heart and don't try and figure out everything on your own. That's where we've gotten in trouble with the Holy Spirit. We've taken this this unpredictable, this all-powerful, this all-knowing God, this person, the third part of the Trinity, and we've tried to fit it into our brain, and therefore we've come out with two really weird camps. And not everybody fits in here, but most denominations and most traditions fit in one of the two. We have this one over here. We'll start over here. We have the conservative camp. The conservative camp sits over here, and, and this camp... This camp is uh, very thoughtful and very uh, uh, knowledge-focused and very uh, doctrine and, and very, uh, you have to believe what we believe, uh, everything we believe, the way we believe it, the way we wrote it, not the way the Bible says, but the, our interpretation of the Bible, and you have to have all that together, and we can't really understand the Holy Spirit. Most of the, the conservative, the, the, the classical, the, this side says, we can't really understand the Holy Spirit, so we kind of just leave it out. People here would say he ceased to exist after the disciples. It makes no sense to me that Jesus said, I'm gonna give you a gift, but I'm just gonna give you a gift and not thousands of years of people that need the same gift. Like, I'm gonna go away, but I'm just gonna give you this gift of the Holy Spirit for a little while. This, this, wow. Talk about rowing. We don't understand it, so we leave it out. This camp, the conservative camp, I love the Father. Father God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. I don't understand it. Conservative. If it doesn't fit in my formula, I don't want to talk about it. Got this camp. We don't have a big enough stage. I could, I could walk all day. The difference between the, that camp over there and this camp over here, conservative, we'll call this camp the charismatic. This camp has made the Holy Spirit into a spectacle. This camp has said, if it doesn't look how it's looked in the past, it must not be God. Like if, if we don't have a three-hour worship service, the people on the floor running victory laps, the Holy Spirit didn't fall. If the message wasn't over my head, if it wasn't deep enough where I don't even understand it, I have any idea what to do about it, and don't even really know what you were talking about, then God must not have been in it. This camp has, has taken the, the miracles of God and just made them about earthly miracles. And we believe in those. We'll talk about that week three, but they forget the most important miracle, which is the miracle of, of salvation. This camp is settled for earthly miracles when there's an eternal miracle that is way more important than earthly miracles. This camp has said like, well, I operate in the gift of, and we're gonna talk week three, you don't have any, you, you, you. that's the Holy Spirit. I'm getting way ahead of myself, getting a little excited here. Both these camps, all well-intentioned. I'm not making fun of you. I'm with you. I've been in both of these camps. I grew up in a, in, the, in a Reformed Baptist background, and I was all about it. And then I got really saved, like super saved, and everybody needed to be super saved. And I was judging everybody that wasn't praying and fasting and speaking in tongues. And I, I've, been, I've been in both these camps. Here's my whole goal for the series. Both camps. Just take a step. This step, I need you to take one step out of weird. Just one. Some of you need to take a, a bigger step. <laughs> Big step. You need to stretch before you step. You're going to pull something. Because this camp over here, we need you. We need your gift. We need your passion. We need your intercession. We, we need your passion for the things of the Lord. But you are so off in what it, getting it backwards on what it's actually about. I just need you to take a step. Because we need you. This camp over here. This camp, oh, this camp wasn't excited. <laughs> okay. That's actually what I do when I run into somebody from this camp. It's like, oh. 
See, that camp over there, they're really fun. This camp, not so fun. This camp hates everybody and most people hate them. <laughs> that camp needs to take one step out of weird. This camp needs to take one step out of miserable. And I get it. I'd be miserable too if I've been rowing my whole life only following a God that fits into my theology, my denomination, which somebody wrote based off their interpretation, by the way. We take steps out of tradition. We may actually find the person of the Holy Spirit and find a, a, a balance of the gifts in the body of Christ. And I want you to tell you that this church, Action Church, I can't speak for everybody, but we need both. We need people that love doctrine. We need people that hold people accountable. We need people that love truth and we need people that love to, to study and to develop and disciple. You're needed, but I need you to not be miserable. I need you to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. I need, we need intercessors and we need feelers and we need worship leaders. We need all of those, but we need to make sure that we've not fallen in love with our tradition and out of love with the things of God. be a lot smaller service next week. <laughs> but the Lord says he's returning for a remnant, and so we'll just be a little remnant here at Action Church. In fact, if you don't take a step out of miserable or weird, I'm sure you could find a church that would love your miserable or weird. We'd like to live on purpose. And hey, we've allowed our tradition to keep us from being effective. And I'm trying to allow us to fall in love with the Holy Spirit and then submit ourselves to what he's calling us to do and be effective as a local church, let go of tradition. Here's the second one, jump all in. There's two types of people at a pool party. There's cannonball and there's stand on the steps. Oh, what's it feel like? How's the water? And you get about knee deep and you're like, I'm good. How's everybody doing? Okay, I'm gonna go back. And, and I don't care if you jump all in with a cannonball or you ease your way in. You're both welcome here, but I'm just asking you for four weeks, just jump all in. It's not dangerous. Holy Spirit's not scary. You're gonna be okay. Like jump all in. Jeremiah 29 says that when we seek God with all of our heart, we find him. Not some, not partial. I'm just asking you, spiritually speaking, to jump all in, to dive into what God wants to teach. Here's the last one. And spoiler alert, the, the point of the whole series is this. Develop a close friendship with the Holy Spirit. Don't let him just be something that we sing about. Don't let him just be something that we talk about, that we read about in Scripture. I need you. You need you. We, we all need a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the amazing grace of the Master. Jesus Christ, the extra extravagant love of God, the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Let me close with this thought. I believe if we don't have the proper view of who he is, then we'll miss the relational aspect of the Holy Spirit. Like we can't objectify him. He's a person, third part of the Trinity. And I get grammatically speaking why it's always referred to this way, why he is always referred to this way. He is a he, not a it. Like he's the Holy Spirit. But can I submit to you today, theologically speaking, it's just Holy Spirit. Because we don't say the God or the Jesus. We say Jesus. It's God the Father. Holy Spirit. We don't approach God the Father and Jesus the Son as a title or as an object. We approach them as a relational being. Let me say it this way. I'm married. My wife's name is, is Gabby. If you always refer to her, say, yes, yeah, Pastor Justin and the wife. We ain't gonna be friends because you've taken a person who you could be in relationship with and you've made them a title or an object. And I'm trying to open you up to the idea that it is not a object to be fit into your formula. He's a person for you to have a relationship. 
stop objectifying and personalize this relationship he wants to have. Gain access to power, peace, and joy. This is a teaching series, but I need you to, to get the urgency of this. This is not something that you just want to have. This is something that you need to have. I think so many people give up on the journey between salvation and the destination, get discouraged in the journey between salvation and the destination because rowing is hard. I just want to let you know there's a better way to live and that is full of the power and the peace and the joy of God and that comes by developing, cultivating, and consistently investing in a close friendship with the Holy Spirit. We need it. To be the man, to be the woman, to be the child of God, to be the father, the mother, the husband, the wife, the business person, the student, Wherever you are, you need this relationship with the Holy Spirit to fulfill and be fulfilled in all that God is calling. Church, you bow your heads and close your eyes at all locations. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the gift that is the Holy Spirit that we have access to a close friendship and that it can change everything. Church, every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity to have a relationship with that Holy Spirit. How how do you do that? You you cannot have access to anything we're gonna talk about over the next four weeks without first accepting Jesus. The Bible says no one comes to the Father but through the Son. And we cannot have access to the gift of the Holy Spirit without first surrendering our life to the Lordship of Jesus. That is a, a prerequisite that we make Jesus the Lord of our lives. As we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, that means that we give Him control, complete control, by the way. It's not a half in, half out type of thing. You are saying, no, no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. For many of you, that's gonna be for the first time ever. Others of you, it's gonna be a recommitment. So pastor, I want that close friendship with the Holy Spirit. Well, it's gonna take you making Jesus the Lord, putting him on the throne of your life. It hasn't been a song that we've sung. It hasn't been a sermon that I've preached. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And you know, I'm not convincing you of anything. This is not an emotional moment. This is actually not the end of anything. It's the beginning of something of you giving your life to Jesus. And you know that you know right now the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you clearly. that Today is your day of salvation. Today is your day of recommitment. You are giving your life to the leadership of Jesus Christ right now. I don't know who I'm sharing that moment with across all of our locations. If that's you today, you say, Justin, I, I want to make that decision. I want to surrender my life to the leadership of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand right where you are and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Got you right there in the middle. Yeah, several more over here. Proud of you. Just giving Jesus access to all of you. A couple more in the stadium, in the middle. Got you all the way in the back. Yeah, I see you. Yep, yep, yep. Come on, Sanford and Oviedo online. So proud of you. Honored that God would allow us to share this moment together this morning. You can put your hands down. If you raised your hand, would you pray this in your heart? As I prayed out loud, say this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I'm saved only by your grace. And today I am confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you, Jesus, are Lord. God, I give you that place, complete control. Have your way in my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us today. I pray we go on a journey over these next four weeks, really opening our minds, opening our hearts, developing a closer relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you for meeting us here today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody at Action Church said amen. And amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions that were just made? So proud of you.